So what is up, people of the Snyderverse? Welcome to my Zack Snyder's Justice League spoiler review. However, this is going to be split up into, I believe, two parts. So in this video, I'm going to be talking about chapters one to three. Now, you may think I might not be getting to some of the juicy uh, stuff that happens in the latter part of the movie. However, don't get me wrong, there, there's plenty of juicy stuff that happens in one to three, because I know some of you guys out there will be dying to hear my thoughts on the epilogue sequence with Joker and Batman, theories with that, breakdowns with that. I didn't want to do you dirty, so I decided to do a dedicated breakdown video on the Joker and Batman scene and just nightmare sequence. Check that video out if you haven't. If you're dying to hear my thoughts on that epilogue scene before going into the overall film, because I, I decided to do that first because it's just so detached. I think a lot of us expected it to be at some point in the movie rather than at the very end, completely disconnected. Enough of me wasting time in this intro because we've got a lot to speak about. Hope you guys enjoy. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below now that you've all finally seen it. And uh, let's get on with this. So, of course, we have to start with part one titled Don't Count On It. Batman, which is, you know, obviously already stark difference to Justice League. Since that movie opened up with obviously the Gotham rooftop scene with the parademon, the random thug, and with him saying he's gone in, when he was referring to Superman. Where does that leave us? Whereas this started off with such a more tasteful and impactful moment, especially coming out of BVS, because I, I found this captivating in the trailers in of itself. Seeing Clark's cries and the, the sonic kind of cries, if you will, wave and echo throughout the world. And that is exactly what what we got in this scene. After Doomsday stabbed Clark, or Superman should I say, we had the ripple effects going out. What more can I say other than it was haunting, it was chilling. The first part of the movie, it, it was really about the fallout of Superman. Some people are calling it a slow burner. I guess I could partially agree with it to an extent, but I still stand by what I said in my spoiler free review here. And how that beginning bit, or well, this Snyder cut in general, was so interesting. And it's so vastly different. I know I said that in my spoiler free video, Video, but I watched some scenes before filming this today of the Justice League, like the, the first hour or whatever, and it is just mind-blowing. I, I don't want to repeat myself too much from my spoiler-free review, but it is cut so differently. The narrative is just so... Oh, uh, man, I'm just gonna... I can't. It's so different. And this is such a better way of going about tackling it. But going back to the slow burner comment, the reason why I say it wasn't so much like that for me is because this was so vastly different from Justice League in the very first seconds of the movie, I was so captivated by all of it. As I kind of mentioned, I found it very chilling, very haunting, very sentimental because I love Henry Cavill's Superman and seeing him cry out like that, see different characters notice, like Cyborg, Silas, uh, we saw the Amazons notice it, and, and, and the Mother Box started awakening. It's just... Wow, what a way to start this film. And another big difference is the Snyder Cut tackles Bruce Wayne going in search of the Aquaman, or as I say, the Aquaman, much earlier on. And obviously this, I think we can all tell the differences between these scenes. I liked the legendary kind of fabled stuff we, we, I believe we heard in the Justice Cuts, you know, where they said he climbed over mountains. Impossible. Well, this is Bruce Wayne, man. Like he's, he's done stuff like that in his youth quite a lot. I mean, he's Batman for crying out loud. And overall, yeah, what, what I would say is, and this reminds me of what Kevin Smith said on the red carpet premiere for the Snyder Cut. He compared the Snyder Cut to like sometimes before a team up, if you will, comic, like you have those, the issues going for character, 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 and then you bring them together for the, the collaboration mission within the, the grand finish or team up moment in that comic run. And the Snyder Cut is very much so like that. It reads, or not reads like that, it, it, but it basically does. It You watch it like that. And it immediately starts, not, not immediately, but you get what I mean, compared to that of the Justice League, starts with these characters beginning with Aquaman being the first one in the recruitment process. And the, throughout the rest of the film, because it has so much more time to breathe, and this is something I echoed quite a lot in my spoiler free review, you really do get so much more depth with the characters and time for them to flesh out more naturally and organically in the story especially when you're doing something which is also borderline risky in of itself in a movie you're introducing multiple characters and not only that not just random characters big characters pillars of dc comics pillars of the justice league aquaman cyborg the flash like literally only before this we had batman and superman and gal gadot's wonder woman in bvs so Zack had to deal with the fact that he had to introduce multiple characters and in this four hour cut it didn't feel rushed. 
Obviously not. Now, you may be like, but that's because it's four hours, but like, think about what people watch these days. We watch many shows, binge multiple seasons, like it's nothing. So I feel like if you adjust your reticule like that, it doesn't actually seem like a fatiguing process to think of watching a four hour thing like the Snyder Cut. And it just isn't anyway when you watch it. It's all fluid, it's all entertaining. I wasn't bored. I don't think it took time to build up to a certain thing. I mean, if you look at it that way, it was a very deliberate process as to what I'm getting at right now for setting these characters up. And I just commend Snyder on how well he approached that because obviously it went to Cyborg with Silas stuff and don't get me started on Cyborg. So I get why you can technically look at this as, well, the Snyder Cut wouldn't work as a four hour theatrical release because you know, you have to, I'm not saying it wouldn't for me, don't get me wrong, but in a business sense, any Joe down the street might not want to sit there for four hours. So I'm very glad this got made. It was very quality with the experience exploration and time it had to explore lots of different things and not only that not ignored the Justice League for the sec for a second the amount of depth into Steppenwolf and Darkseid and their relationship that was non-existent in the theatrical cut. Also, I can understand why they cut some things out. If this, you know, Zack himself completed it, obviously it wouldn't have been a four hour movie in the cinemas. It just wouldn't have. I don't, I'm pretty sure it wouldn't have. They Warner Brothers wouldn't have let that happen. It probably would have been a lot longer than Justice League. But anyway, they cut the scene out of the people of the village singing. Like they basically worship Arthur Curry, the Aquaman. And you can see why, because he's the protector of the seas. He helped that guy out of the boat. He came into town. It, it, there's multiple examples of that. And I found it very chilling, but also very beautiful how you had those people who desperately are so thankful for that protector. But yeah, just another cool little tidbit they decided to chuck in there. It's like, hey, these people really like this guy to the point where they're singing. Up next, we had Alfred meet Bruce at the chopper. I like how he was saying, you know, there might be a metahuman or two in Fiji because that's the usual gig, you know, that Batman's been used to. No, he's not used to this new gods level crap that's going on in the world. But let's move on to that lower scene. One thing that I really love with what Zack did in this is there's a lot of song choices used where we're talking about the Barry and Iris moment we'll get to that in a little bit but also just Lois uh the, the kind of scenes we intermittently got of her in the film dealing with Clark's death before the resurrection we had that song choice with the lyrics saying they told us how gods would outlive us and that was while the camera was panning over Lois looking on where the statue was very sad themes very much so keeping up right up until the near point of when the Superman was revived but now it's time to visit something else that was very different. And oh my, was this different. You may have seen me talk in my spoiler review. I prefer, look, this is interesting because I love what Patty Jenkins has done with Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman 1984 on a writing level, it was extremely flawed. Uh, this isn't a review for that, but like, you know, in, t in terms of popcorn entertainment, like I loved it, loved Godot, loved Gao as Wonder Woman, all of that stuff, loved the vibrancy, loved Pedro Pascal, but like, you know, that that film has uh, quite a few holes. But the reason why I'm mentioning all of that is because you have Patty's Wonder Woman, who did go the Sword and Shield route in w World War One. that makes sense, because kind of like, y y she needed to, uh, but she, she wanted to very much so make Wonder Woman... 1984 about love like I don't think she even equips the shield and sword in that movie and she uses any way like, look it is valid there are very much so multiple versions of Wonder Woman all while blending into kind of one single belonging but I think most people at least for me here I really do prefer Zack Snyder's version here. I would say change it up, give her Patty Jenkins more vibrant suit. Like that just looks like such eye candy. It looks so much better, that vibrant. But the reason why I say this is because I imagine this scene with the hostage situation much differently with, obviously we have the Justice League version, but she still, you know, did a bit of combat in that. But this was much more brutal, but I'm not even on about the brutality. It's just how different it would have been handled by Patty Jenkins. She would have just been like, right, I'll pick you up and put you over here. And it's just like, yeah, you, she could do that. But this scene and how it unfolded was so different to the theatrical cut. It was pretty nuts. She undoubtedly murdered people. And I, I don't mind this so much because Wonder Woman, you know, I know there's going to be people in the comments saying, yeah, but you don't know that this, that this person might not have died. I'm sorry. If you don't believe that this guy got picked up and thrown at the wall, just like in the BVS style, you remember when Batman uh, grapple launched a crate and put that person into the wall and his head went splat almost? Exact same thing here with Wonder Woman yeeting that guy across initially. But let's just say you don't believe that that person died. The main guy 
did die when she brought her massive gauntlet, or should I say, a wrist guard explosion. I mean, we got the cut from the outside of the building. That wasn't in Justice League either. They showed her doing that to that guy, but you didn't get that cut from the outside of the building, which definitely spells it out to the audience that he got absolutely Dr. Manhattan style obliterated in that moment. So Wonder Woman isn't shy of doing this. I don't mind that, but also the theme. The theme was really cool. <laughs> it kind of reminded me of some Witcher 3 memes, you know, when you complete a quest, when your game is out there, you always got the kind of thing going on. You can tell why it's R-rated, not only because of the, the blood. It wasn't always in your face, but there were, you know, R-rated moments like that. You also had F-bombs. Overall, this scene, in my opinion, if you compare it directly with the Justice League one, was so much better. And it, yet again, this is probably one of the prime examples of, other than the R-rated aspects, why would you change it? Also, I'm convinced at the end, that girl that Gal Gadot saved, or should I say Wonder Woman, in where she says, can I be like you one day? And she says, you can be whoever you want to be. That was definitely, I mean, in my opinion, I like to look at that as a nod to Donna Troy because Wonder Girl in her origin, which is a very convoluted character history, but if you're thinking about Donna Troy, Wonder Girl, she was saved by Diana in a very similar kind of circumstance. You could say it's been fleshed out in different iterations, but cliche style from a, like a fire and she saves her and, and then she kind of like saves her. But like, I still feel like this is kind of an adaptation of that. Wonder Woman saves these kids on a school trip or whatever it is. She hones in on one single girl. This girl literally says, can I be like you? She's got brown hair. Yes, I know that's that's not exactly evidence, but the way I see that is it was, it felt like a nod to Donna. I was really hoping that someone like a teacher would say, come on now, Donna, or something like that, call her over. Maybe, and I do kind of understand this, Zach would have felt like if this is the case, what I'm saying, let's just, let's just say that is true. Maybe that would have been too on the nose. But to me, I would love to know if you think, if you're very familiar with the Donna Troy background and Wonder Woman here, if you think that this could have been the DCEU's kind of little hint at that. But let's now talk about Steppenwolf and his first introduction into the movie. We first obviously had Hippolyta asking if there'd been any changes when the mother box had awoken because it slept for thousands of years since the first age. So why is it woken at all now? That kind of stuff, you know, because this, you know, as we're explaining it here, it's a familiar movie because Joss Whedon used Zack Snyder's footage. Uh, but the difference is with this, there's a lot of stuff he didn't use and also a lot of stuff that he reshot. So all while this movie, this is kind of like another interjecting overall generalization, feels similar. It's just still, this is why I feel like I look at it like such unique Schrodinger's cat. How do I say that? You know what I mean? Like both alive and both dead. But also like in this analogy, what I'm trying to get at here, both different, but also the same. And I don't want to say the same. Trust me, I don't. But you, you get my point. Very different, but also... It's such a weird thing, but it's also a fascinating thing at the same time. So, all while this scene was familiar, yet again, vastly different. This was one of the things that popped up before I made this review, as I said. And not only does this just add weight to Steppenwolf, that's like a generalization of this movie in general. But this was just so good. You may have heard me talk about my spoiler review. The reason why I keep re reiterating that is just in case I know some of you probably didn't watch my spoiler-free review. I wasn't a big fan of the spiky armor when it first got revealed. Like, don't get me wrong, I, I thought it was cool, but like, maybe that's... That's just not what I would have signed off on. I don't know. That's not me saying, by the way, that I prefer the Steppenwolf from Justice League. But I was, I didn't like the design. The CGI wasn't that great, but I was more of a fan of how he was more reminiscent of the comics in terms of a helmet rather than the Beast version. But, you know, overall, like in the principle of design, he was more of a humanoid, if you, if you will, with the helmet, just like he is in the comic books. Whereas what they did here, I was just like, it's a bit eccentric, like stabby stabby everywhere. Like, you know, my fingers are like reminiscent of all the different things going on at the same time, but I love it now. Like when I saw it, especially Actually, as we went through the trailer footage more and more, we got more looks at him. I was impressed. But then when I saw this, uh, there's just something about him that looks incredibly good. I don't necessarily want to brand it a feat in the history of CGI, but what I'm saying is a feat compared to that of the Justice League Steppenwolf in terms of not only visual representation and look, but overall characterization and development. And as I said, more weight, more fleshed out stuff, more story to the point of where I felt freaking bad for Steppenwolf. I know there's a meme going around now with the puppy sad eye, and that's kind of what I mean though. It's a bit of a meme, but it's true. I empathize with arguably the biggest, well, not the biggest villain, but you know, obviously that's reserved for Darkseid, but the main guy we got doing that shit on his behalf. I felt bad for him. 
he just wanted to go home. And obviously I want to save that talk for a bit later, but going back to the introduction scene, this still was pretty different from the theatrical cut. This Steppenwolf, and this is this leads more into my suggestion earlier of how it was so evident with the Justice League, even though it was meant to be branching up a continuation in the future of the DCU with all these characters, they were closing it, because that Steppenwolf felt a lot more self-serving, as if like he was getting the mother boxes all for himself, not for Darkseid or for Apocalypse, it's all for him. Because in the theatrical cut, the lines he said to like Apollo or towards the end was like, you will love me, like you will, it's, it's, it's more like me, me. Whereas in the Snyder cut, it's like, my lord, bathing in the darkness of like, what's the cut, like it's all for that guy. Dark side. More or less, bottom line here, what I'm trying to point out is the, the character motivations, even for Steppenwolf, are, they're so different, even despite in both movies, kind of meant to be being the same. Uh, because even though I've said the Justice League was so obvious and how they didn't want to include Darkseid, cut so much of that out, didn't want to set up a sequel, that was still the idea in the background. They just didn't want to give it to you face value. And that's why it came off as if he was so self-serving. Overall, action in the scene, incredible. I much prefer it to the Justice League. That, that goes without saying. It looked great. I love this combat with the Amazons. I love the Amazons sacrificing himself as Hippolyta epically kind of swung out like that. It's kind of similar, but obviously yet different at the same time, seeing like Steppenwolf's armor like snap the arrows. Oh man, but I have to say when Hippolyta says, you know, Amazons, show him your fear. And they're just like, we have no fear. It's epic. I love Hippolyta. But now this far into the video, as you could tell it's long, we have moved on to part two, the Age of Heroes, before we obviously end this video on part three. So part two, the Age of Heroes, it obviously starts with Steppenwolf arriving. He, he transforms the area. He's like, oh, it's toxic. It's good. They, they love that, obviously, because as a result of that energy, he can use the mother box to interface with it. And it basically starts his little fortress base on Earth for where he can keep coming back to hopefully synchronize the mother boxes to form the unity. And yeah, y y you know how it goes. But once again, we get little peeks into how Steppenwolf is feeling with him saying, the unity will be formed. This world will join the others. He will be pleased. He just, he wants to go home. <laughs> I never thought I would give this much of a damn about Steppenwolf. And I'm not saying that I do like compared to other characters, obviously, but I think it's astonishing. And the reason why I'm feeling this way is because I care about him at all. Whereas, you know, the Justice version was just a video game boss. Not, not something you expect a lot of depth to if you're buying a typical $35 game, maybe pre-owned and you just think, okay, whatever. I'm okay with a shitey-esque story. Okay, that villain boss battle, was that was him in the Justice League. But here, as I keep saying and keep mentioning, it's uh, continuously improving, improving as the chapters unfolded on this character and his motivations for wanting to please dark side. Meanwhile, in the background of all of this, we of course had the janitor hearing something at Star Labs. Turns out it was a parademon who broke in. And of course, with the Amazons, we, we have them uh, present Hippolyta with the, the bow and arrow of Artemis, if you will, so she can warn the lands of men. It was basically down to Diana to get that message. Of which she did, and th this is a nitpick, but I was just thinking, because there were police on scene or whatever with their cars, I don't get how she was just allowed to walk up there and take this artifact, because I, 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 I'm pretty sure a bystander, even somebody in Diana's position who recovers artifacts like that, it just felt like you wouldn't be able to get past the tape and do that. But either way, I was still very thrilled by that scene because we got to see her kind of go down Tomb Raider style and look at the ancient kind of tapestry, if you will, of the Battle of Old, which we will dive into in a little bit. Also with the Star Lab stuff, of course, this is around about the time of where we first saw Ryan Choi, obviously working for Silas Stone, advising them on the Xenoscience, which is, I believe, you know, another word for alien technology. Yet another thing that it probably makes you wonder, like with the fact that we got Star Lab scenes in the Justice League cut, so why didn't you just include that scene with Ryan Choi, even if it was the brief one before he appeared in other scenes later on? Like why not just kind of include him talking about the mother box or the missing object 6192 that would have still been something fans would have appreciated and yet again just the never-ending baffling uh, uh kind of questions of fans saying why did they cut this why did they cut that why i we, you can say it to an extent of oh because the movie couldn't be theatrically four hours but you can only say that 
so many times until there are some scenes they definitely could have kept in and also just not reshot. Now, if you guys remember me talking about song choices earlier, I mentioned the lowest one and we had the actual character moment ones with uh, Ezra's Barry. As I said, we will get onto that. But we also had this moment with Arthur around this point in the film where we had that ship going down, Mayday, Mayday, the Aquaman arrives, he saves the guy, tells the barman to tell him to mind the storm next time. And we get Arthur walking out to the sea, except we had that song choice and the lyrics being used saying that there is a kingdom there is a king so once again organic without me repeating myself here too much it's another deep dive into the character slowly setting him up whereas in the justice league it was just the bruce wayne goes to meet him kind of stuff and like he pops in eventually later but now at this point he goes down into the water and meets volko because it's kind of meant to be teasing his setup for his story he focuses on that trident which is when willem defoe's volko approaches and the message more or less is take up your mother's trident he mentions that how his brother or half brother if you will is fanning the flames of war setting up the future plot and so it's just like all of this could have still been in the movie I, i'm pretty sure fans would have appreciated that so yet again more examples of stuff where it's just like we didn't even see willem defoe's volko i'm pretty damn sure in the justice league why wouldn't you even just include willem defoe in there because it's willem defoe one thing i will say i liked about arthur in this movie is i felt like joss whedon made him a bit more of a dick i know arthur comes off a bit combative but he's not necessarily inherently a dick at first even in the snyder cut with bruce he's a bit apprehensive you kind of would be with the way arthur goes about you know his life but in this version he has a lot of compassion and sympathy for like cyborg later on and, and whatnot whereas in the justice league i felt like i know in this movie he does voice concerns where what if cyborg is working with the enemy but like i felt like in the theatrical cut he was just he was always like that or more or less consistently like that not up until a point of where he disliked him as a character because I, i'm pretty sure we still even in theatrical cut enjoyed aquaman as much as we could through jason momoa's bad archery but i'm just saying in this even though he is the same character it, he's he's the best version of what snyder's aquaman could be uh, versus that of the theatrical cut. So I just wanted to mention that because with Aquaman's extra scenes in this movie, I feel like it, 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 he obviously wasn't as mad of a spectrum change as what we experienced with Cyborg, but he's definitely a change that is incredibly noticeable in the Snyder Cut. That I think is 100% worth noting. Back to Steppenwolf, but this time with Dessard. Now, I, I, I think... This almost goes without saying like how cool it is to see this compared and, and how much context it adds in. This is one of the first appearances within the whole movie where we get scenes like this and then eventually Darkseid coming in and Steppenwolf is like, oh my god. Uh, but yeah, still, th this right off the bat just tease more greatness to come. I feel like this movie does quite literally work like walking upstairs in the best kind of way. You're walking up, but the whole time you're ascending to something better i know my analogies are weird sometimes but like i feel like this scene with everything i've spoken about it applies to as well but this scene between steppenwolf and Dassad speaks to what will come later and much bigger with dark side and, and cooler just interactions and lore between these characters that we don't know too much about albeit from the source material we do but not the snyderverse iteration so to speak so we had Dassad say steppenwolf have you begun the conquest and steppenwolf kind of replies with the world is divided his primitive species unevolved and at war with one another too separate to be one their free will must be ripped from them like the other worlds given absolution in one glorious relief to serve him and if you couldn't tell already he's like the biggest fanboy of wanting to please dark side then this is where you start to feel bad or at least i did for steppenwolf because we had the side there just like me i'm dark side i'm sat by dark side unlike you saying mighty steppenwolf who might have sat here by the side of the great one but undone by his self pride now this is important because you may or may not know in the comic book material in the super traditionalist way dark uh, steppenwolf is Darkseid's uncle and like in a similar way he's kind of kicked out excommunicated if you will from the, the inner circle because of some drama that happens I believe if memory serves me well I think he kills Uxus's aka Darkseid's brother and it, it, it turns out to be one kind of misconstrued thing and I feel like even without them saying it here directly like oh I killed your brother like Darkseid's brother they're basically nodding 
to the comic book storyline of where he obviously got kicked out. He's trying to redeem himself by un uniting the mother boxes into the unity, getting back home, all because he was kicked out through what the lines say here. So the new god of Apocalypse Dark Side and his close circle, if you will, uh, view it as, you know, Steppenwolf was undone by his self-pride. But as Steppenwolf said himself, Desaad, I fall before you. Let me make a plea to him that I may come home after I take this world in his name. Desaad then replies, you betrayed him. Your own family. So that kind of speaks to the, the murder, if you will. But like as Steppenwolf says here as well, I saw my mistake. I slaughtered those who sought his throne. Now yet again, if memory serves me well, Darkseid's brother sought the throne. And you know, I, I think Uncle Steppy wanted to kind of help out, but they viewed it as, oh my God, you just killed my brother. But you see what I mean? It feels like this is a guy who knows that he had the best intentions from the beginning, even though he's meant to be an evil guy in the movie. And he is, he is, don't get me wrong. But like, these guys believe they're doing the right thing. Let's just put it that way. Steppenwolf once upon a time thought he was trying to protect Darkseid. He slaughtered those who went for the, for the throne, basically hinting at the comic book material storyline for the similar situation to what happened. And ever since, he's just begging to come back. He wants to make a plea. He wants to please Darkseid. So do you, do you know what I mean? That just kind of makes me feel bad for him. Even though you're meant to be rooting for the Justice League, you know this isn't going to disappear anytime soon. You know you've got the rest of the movie. So I was kind of rooting for Steppenwolf in some regards just because I was that much more interested in this story with the drama of Apocalypse and that internal family crap that was going on. I think you guys can get what I'm saying by now especially with the dialogue that they gave us between Desaad and Steppenwolf but that continued on with Desaad saying you still owe the Great One 50,000 more worlds. He will hear your plea when you pay your debt. And yeah to say it once again so much more fleshed out it's ridiculous and this leads us to arguably another fleshed out thing but so much more so that it was just so good to see so here we had diana you know kind of talking to bruce while he's fixing up the ship and she retells what she recently saw in the tapestry form on the wall him about these beings from another universe so she says from what i've learned there are things from another universe they serve a dark power an old power they invade to conquer and they came here once before long ago now i shouldn't really have to state this this is the most obvious difference in how in the theatrical cut it was steppenwolf <laughs> the model of dark side in this version was steppenwolf in the original cut and it's just there's so much different uh, why this is what i mean with the whole suggestion of that they just didn't want to do a sequel even as it was being made by joss because why wouldn't you have Darkseid there? Like, why not? To take that away only means that you don't want to sit up and flesh it out and tease that there's a bigger thanos -y level cinematic plan villain for this movie and world that you're fleshing out with these movies in the first place. So... Do you see what I mean? And in this version, it was just so cool. Diana says a great armada appeared in the sky. And we see Ares, we see Zeus give Ares his axe. The gods are just imbued with all of this power. She continues that with the great armada, it laid waste to all of those who opposed it. The leader of the invaders was a being called Darkseid, a name cursed and feared in every universe. Darkseid was met in battle by Earth's defenders, the old gods, men, Atlanteans, before their descent into the sea. Amazons before their betrayal and enslavement and the guardians from the stars and those guardians from the stars even though we properly haven't met them even though very recent news does indicate that Zack Snyder did indeed actually try and put that into his movie but that's a whole other video uh, and actually may have actually filmed something the guardians from the sky obviously the lanterns and it was great seeing Zack Snyder's kind of um mock-up of what a lantern suit would look like and how that would have translated I'm sure like there would still be opportunities for a different design in modern day you don't have to say all of the guardians from the skies lantern suits are the same but it was really cool and if anything it was pretty funny where Darkseid had that little cheeky look with the ring flying away like it was like oh and he tries to grab it so what's important next and, and as cool as it was presents one of if not the only one of the only issues in the movie or maybe I'm just misunderstanding but for those who have got to this point in the video I'd love to know your thoughts on this so Darkseid waged war on earth he found a secret there a power hidden in the infinity of space he called forth the mystics who worshipped and controlled three boxes, the mother boxes. Indestructible living machines made from a science so advanced it looks like sorcery to conquer. Three boxes have to synchronize to join together in the unity. The unity cleanses a planet with fire, transforming it into a copy of the enemy's world. All who live become servants of Darkseid, alive 
but drained of life. Now, what I meant by one of the only issues or maybe misunderstandings here from me is like Steppenwolf and the way they articulate this in the movie found the world of the mother boxes on it again. They're both simultaneously acting like they haven't been there before, but they have. And the characters are kind of simultaneously acting like, oh, he's found the world. But then they also very explicitly explain that Darkseid's been here before. And yes, obviously he got embarrassed and he got away in just a nick of time before he really got crushed by the old gods. But it's like, if you wanted to find the boxes again and in all of these years that have passed thousands of years why are there certain lines in the movie where they praise Steppenwolf for finding this place you know it's got the anti-life equation but also the boxes that they could use to you know throw a lot into the mix uh, it's just like it, I'm confused with the aspect of they treat it like they lost the world I'm pretty sure at least from what I'm gathering and this is where I get confused they would have had Earth mapped out to come back again to one day. Sure, they, like, Darkseid ran away. They got pushed back by the defenders of Earth. But they left the three mother boxes there. And I'm not even saying they had to come back in the next few thousand years. Because they didn't. But, like, maybe it's because he didn't want to. And he was waiting to be extra pumped. But why act like you didn't know where the world was when you'd been there before? I felt like, unless I'm missing something very crystal clear... That was a little bit of a conflict or contradiction in the movie. Because, long story short, Darkseid's been there... They also articulate that Steppenwolf has found the world with the mother boxes, the old one. But it's like, did you not realize where that was? I, I don't know, but moving onwards. But yet again, to praise this scene, I loved the action. I loved seeing visual effects up close of a, a Snyder iteration of a lantern. I loved seeing Zeus literally charging bolts. Uh, I did kind of find it quite meme and funny how Ares didn't go for the head and he went for the neck. I mean, Darkseid was pretty, like, almost done there. And he was bleeding out quite a bit. But you, you get my meme, like, he, he could have kind of killed him, but, like... You should have gone for the head. Okay, I'm sorry to do an MCU joke here, but I trust you know what I mean with that. And also, just, just in of itself, it was really cool seeing Ares like, like that for that long when we've seen him in Wonder Woman before, but I guess in his prime. And even though I knew we would get more in the Snyder Cut of this, it's still a lot more than what I thought we would get. And I think that's where it caught some people off guard. We knew we were getting more from Snyder, but it just kind of went on and on and on. Considering it's such a big battle with a lot of CGI, you just, I, I think we expect it to end anytime now, but it kept going on. And I was really, really happy with that. At this point with the mother boxes left on earth, the, the, the Yamada sent back into the stars in a very, embarrassing way we had the kind of montage of the different peoples uh, burying the boxes even though I did find it funny at times I thought that's not a very deep grave men to put in the mother box and I was like that's not very deep you could have gone a bit further <laughs> we also get a shot of Ray Porter I don't know if you guys recognized it first time like I did it, it, it was kind of obvious he was right there uh, when they were kind of like smashing uh, the, the kind of concrete surrounding the mother box. And this more or less brings us to part three, which is probably where I'm going to end the video. Not like right now, but this will be the last chunk of blabbering I will do. So this was titled Beloved Mother, Beloved Son. And this is where we start with Barry Allen. Now I said in my spoiler free review that I didn't really understand why people thought that Barry would be so different in this version. Like the fact that we would get a director's cut, right? The Snyder's cut. Granted that Joss Whedon did literally add more tasteless jokes onto Ezra Miller's character, what I was getting at when I said that is that the demeanor, the, the approach and delivery that Ezra has won't, I can't see change from his character. And I had the same attitude with uh, Jared Leto's Joker, albeit that he did kind of stay the same, but just spoke down a little bit more of his delivery into a more of a normal voice. And that was much more improved. Now with Barry Allen in this film, I don't dislike him. Like I think he, I enjoyed the speedster moments. I enjoyed everything like that. However, I just think it's a miscast for Barry Allen. But what I can do is still try and appreciate this take, this iteration of a speedster. And I kind of like to think of it like Barry with the speed force is like a guy with ADHD. Like, I feel like he acts like somebody with ADD, but I feel like in this take, I can imagine the speed force. If you like that, you, you, you can be fast and do this, that, and the other. And trust me, I have thoughts upon thoughts upon thoughts at the same time. I really do identify with the ADD kind of side. And I don't know why I'm saying that as if like I've confirmed that Barry has ADD, but I feel like that's what Snyder is approaching with the speed force. He is quirky Alan because 
He is eccentrically infused with the speed force in the sense that it affects his be behavior almost. Do you know what I mean? And there were still jokes like, hi, Barry, I'm D Diana. I, I just, I don't find it funny that much, but I do understand with reading some of your comments on the spoiler review as well, that in a team up, you kind of sometimes do need a bit more of a fun spirited character and Snyder maybe wanted to give that to the Flash. Now that is kind of accurate because the Flash can be quirky and barky back with jokes in the comics and in the material. It's just, I still feel like Ezra isn't quite that dude, but when I do see him act serious, like the Henry Allen scene, this that and the other I do much more prefer that now I still want to reserve judgment on Ezra Miller's flash like I said in my spoiler free review I know I keep saying that but I keep reiterating it because I know a lot of you might not have watched it is that he may very well be the flash I really like in flashpoint so he may take the best bits of this movie and he might get the direction from Andy Machete on the set of flashpoint where it's like okay maybe not be as quirky still be the flash that you've been in the DCEU but like maybe tone it down to the scenes that I personally liked best. And I might love Ezra's back. So that's why I want to still put him on the back burner for me and not be like, oh, I do not like this barrier at all. And that would just wouldn't be true even if he was the same quirky Alan in Flashpoint. And the reason why I wanted to mention all of that, because I still liked a lot of his scenes in this movie, the extra scenes. I did find it, I mean, it depends how whimsical you, you or how much you love stuff like this, I suppose. So when he first saw Iris, I guess depends if you believe it, love at first sight, you can definitely like link eyes with people and have that infatuated, like almost first moment. The love at first sight kind of look, right? But I felt like it, it, they almost made it a bit too deliberate with the lightning rod Iris West and Barry Allen connection right off the get-go. Some of you may disagree with that, and I almost find myself trying to combat myself with that, because this is Barry Allen and Iris West, right? They are quite a unique pinnacle couple out of all couples you could get. So why wouldn't their first meeting be quite, like, lubby-dubby and like, ah, but I don't know. It was almost just a centimeter or too much on the nose. And what I mean by that as well is when the accident went down, we obviously had Iris smiling at Barry the whole time which led to the car accident and as much as I'm kind of questioning this scene even though I really appreciate it like I love the speed force twist and the destruction of the boots like all of that stuff like I said it before as much as I found it like oh that's lovely but also kind of creepy like you don't know this girl as you're stroking her hair I know he th there's th that initial infatuation there when he first met her but it's just like and, and by the way I really love the song choice in this moment another song choice as I mentioned earlier with Arthur and what we've had so far we had gentle piano here that I felt perfectly fit the scene was meant to set up how this is meant to be a future legendary couple, Barry Allen and Iris West, right? Similar to that of the Lois Lane and, and Superman and, and this, that and the other with other characters. And there is something oddly romantic about it as he's kind of creepily stroking her hair. I mean, it's not too creepy at all. He's just literally moving her hair like that. But as I said, I felt like you could have still had the beauty of these two future romantic couple people being depicted in this moment through that soundtrack, through the delicate way that Barry handled her. Like, I still really like that. He, he went very gentle. And that is probably scientific as well, because if he put too much force on her, that could literally like yeet her too far in a consequence of his external force on her as of when the speed force disengaged. So yeah, he was very gentle with her, but also I like to look at that romantically. But yeah, I just feel like there was a couple of moments, long story short, where I felt like it was a little bit too much. I don't know though, what about you? Like, I feel like people might think I'm maybe going in too hard on that, and I don't think I am. It's just in my personal take, I think. But people have just met each other, even with the love at first sight thing, infatuation in mind, it just felt they could have toned it down a little bit. But I still really liked the scene and the way it was depicted, the way it was shot, the cinematography of it, the score that kicked in with the piano. It, it was really awesome. Now at this point in the film, Steppenwolf is really ramping up his search for the mother boxes. We saw that scene of where he's dragging Atlanteans out of the water. He dehelms one of them, crushes the helmet, not before also just smacking him into a rock. Wonder Woman style, if you know what I mean from earlier on in the movie. And that's where we get our little spider device, just basically di dissecting the information out of his head. Yeah. Yeah, again, I you know, you could just still argue, even with their version of Steppenwolf, they could have included little scenes like that. Now, revisiting some of the lowest parts, this is very quick and brief, but we, we kept getting Lois dealing with the grief. She looked at Clark's stuff in the trunk, and it just kind of came over the dun 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 dun. I'm like, ah! Don't do it! Like, any time. I, I, I don't know, it's just so powerful. 
it's just I was talking about this just last night with people on Discord, and how I truly believe that theme rivals that of the original Superman theme in terms of a modern era iteration, right? Modernized version, and those two or three or four piano notes that just come on, paired with obviously the fallout of the death of Superman, Lois Lane with Amy Adams doing a brilliant job in this movie, it just really rips my heart out and throws it over there. <laughs> and you know what, guys? The next part of what I'm gonna talk about in my notes because I took so many notes during the movie to make sure I really chronologically kind of remembered it. But the next parts are very cyborg centric in part three. So I kind of want to end the video here. I know I said I, I technically have done one to chapter three, but we're stopping during chapter three. So in the part two spoiler review, I will continue that. I would then go into chapter four, five, and then six, hopefully. Who knows? I might have to make it into another video if I keep talking so much. But I really do appreciate the ability to have I, I don't care that this is a longer review I know some people hate that but it's kind of inherent with a Snyder Cut review I like the format of this being more of a podcast conversation for all of you diehard Snyder fans who also really enjoy watching me on this channel it's something like a companion piece like DLC content for a video game that you can kind of just enjoy after the fact of watching it do you know what I mean so I, I hope you enjoyed our nerd out discussion on the first three chapters and a bit of Zack Snyder's Justice League and we will We'll get into the very, very, very juicy stuff of when Darkseid comes in a lot more, Superman's return, the many new scenes with that, the Omega Beam scene, and, and, the, and the death of Lois. And there's so much. There's so much still yet to go. So I hope you guys look forward to that. I really appreciate you guys, especially if you got this far into the video. If you did, prove it. I mean, my God, I don't know if there's going to be many replies. I only do this every now and again to see how many people got to this point. Along with your comment in the comment section down below, type in... Hashtag justice for Steppenwolf. <laughs> I, I feel bad for him, okay? Other than that, though, ladies and gentlemen, thank you once again so much for watching. You can follow me more in a top pin comment where there are links to my Twitter, my Discord server where you can join, talk to me personally, places you can support me more like Patreon and good stuff like that. So, yeah, once again, hope you all have a lovely rest of your day and I'll see you people of the Snyderverse in the next video. Goodbye.